So uh, what I will talk about today is actually the first time I'll talk about it. And it's also a kind of a new subject. It's the first thing I've done about uh, um, uh, synapses. So I, I hope uh, this will work. Uh, you see a nice little picture in the corner of uh, Janus Kobersmed, who is uh, the main author of this paper. And I think he's listening in. Are you there, Janus? I am, yeah. Yes, yes. That's very good. So he can help me out if there's something I've misunderstood. So this uh, ha has been uh, really uh, uh, an interesting uh, work. So Janus was my uh, bachelor student in mathematics. He's uh, extremely talented in mathematics, but decided that he wanted to understand more in biology and started studying a uh, medical doctor, with his, which is... Uh, very much uh, on his way. And uh, uh, then we decided, because uh, he really did a very, very uh, good theoretical work, and we decided we wanted to continue working on these uh, uh, neuronal models. And uh, I had uh, discussed with uh, this neuroscientist, uh, can you see my mouse? I hope so. So Jakob Bensler Sørensen, who is a neuroscientist at, uh, also at University of Copenhagen, uh, and we decided to make a project together uh, and, and put Janus to work on that. And then also Alexander uh, Walter, uh, who is in Berlin, and he has done the experimental work uh, on, on uh, what, what we are going to present today. And we started, the three of us, to uh, uh, supervise uh, uh, Janus in this work. And now I think Janus is the one uh, understanding more than any one of us about this. So the title is quite complicated, but I hope to... Uh, to explain everything. So uh, let's start. So what we will uh, talk about is uh, synaptic transmission and uh, the data comes from uh, Drosophila in the neuromuscular junction. So uh, the only thing we, we have to know for now is that we have two, two neurons and we have a presynaptic neuron, this one, that is sending a signal to a postsynaptic neuron and then it connects at different uh, synapses and what we want to understand is what is going on in a single synapse so let's zoom in on this uh, synapse on the next picture we are zooming in so what we see here just to uh, uh, get straight what we are talking about this that i am uh, encircling here is the presynaptic a neuron uh, that is uh, just the synapse where uh, the signal is coming from. Here we have the postsynaptic neuron and everything that is yellow is extracellular space. So this is the synaptic cleft. Uh, and if we look here at the synapse in the pre-neuron, we see all these uh, things here are vesicles. And these are the vesicles that contain neurotransmitter and in, in such a chemical uh, synapse. And that is the uh, substance that it is sending to the postsynaptic neuron. So what is what is happening is that when an action potential arises, uh, it uh, goes down here and opens these calcium channels. So you see a little drawing here of a calcium channel. That calcium channel opens up, and uh, a lot of calcium in a very very spiked uh, and very localized uh, uh, signal is uh, flowing into um, into the cell. And that comes from uh, how much is the extracellular calcium concentration. So this signal goes in and then it is sensed by vesicles. And if these vesicles are in what is called, you can see here it says active zone. So if they are in this active zone, so it means they are docked in this active zone and they are on top of that primed, that means that they can actually release their neurotransmitter. So if it, they sense the uh, calcium, it will release a neurotransmitter up to the synaptic cleft, and that will be sensed in the post neuron. So what we actually measure is the current response in the postsynaptic neuron. And what we want to understand is this whole uh, uh, mechanism of these synapses. But more than that, we want to understand one specific thing that I will uh, get back to. So, so just remember this. In the postsynaptic neuron, we are uh, measuring this evoked excitatory junctional current, 
which we, uh, for short, we, we write it like this. So this is the signal and we want to understand what is going on up here. And we will uh, construct some mathematical models because there's some biological uh, um, uh, hypothesis that we will try to answer with some uh, stochastic models, in fact. So let's first look at how the response could look at could look for one one action potential is uh, arriving at the presynaptic neuron how would the response look at the postsynaptic neuron so we see here so uh this is uh, uh one set of experiments another set another set another set another set for five different extracellular calcium concentrations and what is going on is that this one is the response in the postsynaptic neuron in uh, just in its resting state. Then uh, the action potential is arriving at the presynaptic neuron, which makes it release a neurotransmitter, which is sensed by the postsynaptic neuron. And this is the black one is the average response for this given extracellular, uh, extracellular uh, calcium concentration. And what we see on top are single sweeps from single uh, um, uh, trials. So the first, first thing we notice is that the amplitude is changing according to the extracellular calcium concentration. And co this comes from the fact that if the extracellular con uh, calcium concentration is higher, the signal going into the presynaptic neuron of calcium is higher and more uh, uh, neurotransmitter will be released. And that will be released in, in, in quantal uh, uh, numbers. So that uh, means that we are assuming that uh, a certain number of uh, uh, vesicles are releasing their uh, uh, neurotransmitter. And then the number of those can nearly uh, be counted as how high is this amplitude. But we also see that there is a variance from trial to trial. And this is what we can see uh, uh, depicted over here. So what we have on the x-axis is the mean response in the postsynaptic neuron for these five different calcium concentrations. Then we also have a variance because we are measuring in different cells and six different cells. So we also have a variance and that variance uh, also varies. So here we see, for example, for the low calcium concentration, these are the standard deviations around the mean uh, response, and then we have a variance. When we plot that, we see we can fit this uh, uh, second order polynomial curve to it. So it has a kind of a binomial type uh, uh, response. So it actually has for a certain uh, amount of calcium, uh, high enough calcium, it will have a variance of zero. So what does that mean? The variance is zero. Of course, the variance is not zero here. This is what we measure here. So it's not zero, but, but uh, uh, modeling like this, that we are actually saying that the variance will be zero. It means at some point, the response will always be the same. No variation. So how can we interpret that? Well, we interpret that as saying that there is a certain amount of available vesicles that it can release and when the calcium is high enough all of them are being released in every trial so there's no variance it just says release them all if on the other hand the calcium concentration is very low well in fact it will be released none so the variance is also zero but the mean is also zero because there is no response there is no vesicle released but in between, there is stochasticity. Uh, and that depends on how many uh, vesicles are being recruited, how, how many vesicles are actually releasing their neurotransmitter. Uh, and this will vary from time to time. So this is the first point that tells us that we need a stochastic model in order to understand this relationship. Because if you do, we do a deterministic model, we will not see this variance and we cannot check on this part of the model without a stochastic model. And also just, just uh, uh, to wrap up this part, uh, where it, it touches here, 
relates to how many vesicles there are. We, you cannot read it here because it's the mean, so it depends on, 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 on how much response uh, a single vesicle gives. Uh, but it will. we can read directly uh, how many vesicles there are here. Okay, that was for one action potential. And that is actually not our question. Our question is different. Our question is, what happens if we have two action potentials in a row very close to one another? In particular, we have it with 10 milliseconds in between. So there will be two action potentials coming to the presynaptic neuron, and we want to understand what's going on. So let's look at what the experiment says. So everything on this slide is experiment. We have no models yet. So uh, now we have normalized to the amplitude of the first release. So we just say that the first release has an amplitude of one. So this is this line. So that means, just go back one slide. Here we see increasing, 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 but we just divide by this amplitude. So now they're all normalized. Now we look at the second response. So we see that for low calcium concentrations, the second response is larger than the first. So that means it, it's, it, it's like uh, the first action potential is waking up the system, then comes the second one, and then comes a larger response. So that is what we call the, the, the short-term plasticity, is what, how is it reacting? And we call that facilitation. So I'll, I'll explain what this is in a second. Facilitation means a higher response in the second one. Whereas we see at the high calcium concentration, the second response is actually smaller. We call that depression. So what is this PPR, the paired pulse ratio? Well, that is the ratio between the amplitude of the second response divided by the amplitude of the first response. So here we have the first response. And now, uh, since there will be some residual calcium, we cannot measure the second response as the peak towards the basal level. We have to measure it towards the basal level that it has after the first response. So what we do is simply fitting an exponential decay, and then we see where the, the, this uh, peak is. We compare it to uh, another basal level. So we have this is the second response. This is the first response. So in this case, we have facilitation because we divide this by this. This is larger. So we will have a paired pulse ratio, which is larger than one. So we have facilitation. And if we plot that for all our experiments, yes, please, there's an, a question. Is there a question? I did, I, I cannot hear anything. It wasn't a question. It was, it was not a question. No. Okay. So uh, here we see the extracellular calcium and we see the, the, the five experiments for the five different concentration of extracellular calcium. Then we see with the standard deviation around uh, the mean of the paired pulse ratios that we get from the experiment. So what do we see? For low concentrations down here, these two, we have facilitation. So a larger second response, but for high, we have depression. This is what we want to understand. This is what we want to get a model for. So our first model, so yes, the aim is understand the facilitation. Oh, okay, I have one slide before. So we want to do stochastic models for many reasons and for many, uh, uh, um, uh, well, both because some part of it we need it and also because some of the things that I'll, con I'll get back to that, that we want to understand needs a stochastic models. So all the chem chemical systems, they are stochastic. Uh, and we know that reactions happen with a certain probability. So when we use deterministic equations, they are approximation to the stochastic dynamics, and very often they can be very nice. But however, if we have few reactants, or if we have few numbers, and in this case, uh, we have few numbers of vesicles, uh, well, on the order of 100 to maybe 1,000, but we have few of them, that means that the deterministic approximations are very bad. So we need a stochastic systems system. Moreover, the stochastic simulations are doable exactly because the number are small. 
Furthermore, we have uh, this discreteness in the fact that the vesicle fusion events gives rise to these mini excitatory uh, postsynaptic currents. So, so they are like quantal. So uh, uh, when we have the ODE systems, the ordinary differential equation systems, the deterministic equations that approximate this, this will be fine if the numbers are big, but they are really a pro problem when the numbers are small. Moreover, we need the stochastic system in order to even understand the variance. So it allows this estimation of the variance. What is very important for this work, which was for the biologists, the most important thing was that the physical distances to calcium channels are stochastic. I'll get back to that. I'll just talk very shortly about the last point, namely that these uh, paired pulse ratios, they cannot be determined from deterministic simulations. And the fact that they cannot be determined from deterministic simulations come from uh, uh, a mathematical result uh, uh, in, in, in stochastic analysis. Well, it's uh, basically it's Jensen's uh, in inequality, but it is oft, often overlooked by biologists. So why can we not determine the pair pulse ratios from deterministic simulations? Well, that is basically because the mean of the ratio of two variables are not equal to the ratios of the mean. And actually, uh, uh, this is what we see in the experiment because we have the second divided by the first amplitudes. These are stochastic variables. And this is what is being observed in an experiment. But often compared to the deterministic system, and in the deterministic system, we only get the mean, we see no variance. So actually what we get is this. And then Janus that made this uh, very nice uh, 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 drawing where we can actually see how much it actually matters. So here are, uh, we, we, we don't really care about replenishment let's, uh, or non-replenishment. Let's just look at the replenishment. Uh, I don't want to use time on explaining that right now, but uh, these uh, dots are from the stochastic model, and then we have from the deterministic model, which is just the mean. And we see that for small, this Q max is just a, a measure of, of uh, the calcium concentration, let's say. Um, for small uh, concentrations, we see a huge difference. So this really has uh, the nonlinearity becomes uh, much. Uh, it, it is, of course, uh, because when, when uh, the concentrations are small, the variability is larger. So... Uh, and, and it's, it's actually quite interesting because you see this stochastics gives a higher pair pulse ratios than the deterministic system. And one of the big problems has actually been in the model to, to construct models that reproduce the high pair pulse ratios that we see in experiments. And here we can actually see that the first point is that if you don't look at stochastic system, you will not, uh, you, you, it will be much more difficult to actually find these high pair pulse ratios. Uh, which might uh, give a, a huge problem for the biologists that want to find it if they only look at deterministic models. So this is uh, an important thing. Okay, but what actually uh, um, started this work was the fact that uh, they had experiment. So so, so the, the 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 many of the models explaining this facilitation uh, comes from. Uh, trying to make a model for the topology of the uh, calcium channels and the vesicles where they are docked. So, so what are the distance uh, inside the presynaptic neuron for these vesicles to this current of, of uh, calcium coming in? And uh, as we always do, uh, uh, us mathematicians, we always simplify, and then we make uh, simpler models in order to be able to describe it. So one thing that has been done is placing one point source of calcium, and then around it, in the same distance, just in a circle around, well, we place the vesicles. And models like that have been constructed, and uh, um, uh, uh, pair pulse ratios or uh, facilitations of pair pulse ratios larger than one have been found in these models. So that's fine. It turns out, and I think that has been one of the very exciting thing of this uh, project, and it took us very, very long to explain it, and now it will seem very simple once we uh, have understood it, 
But I, I want to say this has really, really been a long work to even understand this. And I think one of the very nice things to understand that in the moment that you uh, relax that, uh, say, simplification in the mathematical model of having the same distance to, to, uh, from the calcium source, suddenly the facilitation is ruined. Why does that happen? So let's look at it. So this is the drawing where we see uh, this is uh, the membrane. So here we have uh, the extracellular space. Down here would be the postsynaptic neuron. So this is the intracellular space of the presynaptic neuron. Here we have the calcium coming in. And this blue color tells us that the calcium is flowing in and it gives us the concentration gradient that it creates inside the cell. Then we have one uh, uh, vesicle at a certain distance and another vesicle a little further away. And then we'll look up here. This graph is, so we have time here. We don't have time down here. We just have time in the graph, okay? So here it's, it's before then the, the uh, action potential is coming and then there comes a steep rise in the calcium concentration that goes down very fast as well. So this is maybe two or four milliseconds or something like that. Okay, so it's very short. So it has a very sharp, large calcium uh, uh, signal telling it to release its neurotransmitter. So this is what it, it sees at this distance. Whereas at the longer distance, it only sees this. And no, uh, uh, so, so the probability, because the, it is a probability a distribution here, the probability of release is, is much smaller. So here it's much bigger, here it's much smaller, and it depends on the distance. So that means if we place all vesicles in our model at the same distance, they will all have the same probability of releasing. And it will be like a binomial model, kind of, okay? Uh, but when we have uh, uh, this, uh, uh, if, if they are not located at the same distance, this will be very different. So let's look at how it looks uh, 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 at at uh, how this calcium uh, signal looks. So here we have time, there's a break here. So from zero to four milliseconds, and then again from 10 to 14 milliseconds. So an action potential here is giving, uh, so, so we have an, a, a signal of the calcium coming in at two milliseconds and 10 milliseconds later at 12. If you are at, uh, for, for a certain uh, extracellular calcium concentration, we have a shorter distance and a longer distance. At the shorter distance, we have this distribution. At the longer distance, we have this distribution. We also see that the two distribution of the calcium signals are the same in the first action potential and in the second uh, action potential, basically. We can also look at how they change compared to the extracellular calcium concentration. And we see that, of course, it's much higher with a uh, larger extracellular concentration and smaller without it at a certain distance. Okay, so far so good. So how do we figure out how they are actually placed? And this is what we had in the experiments also. So we have this, uh, that, that was made by uh, the, the laboratory of, of, of uh, um, uh, Alexander Walter, uh, who's uh, uh, the senior author of this paper. So you have this uh, electron uh, microscopy images. So what we see here, uh, actually it's a stained uh, 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 protein that tells us where the vesicles are. So this line here, it's drawn up. This line here is the membrane. So here we are in the extracellular space. Here we are in the intracellular space. This blue thing is at the center of this is the calcium source. And then we see all the vesicles. And these three vesicles are the docked vesicles. So we see that there's a distance from here to here, and there's a distance from here to here, and then there's a distance from here to here. And this was done uh, many times. So what we see here is a history. The blue one is a histogram of the distances measured the, of the docked vesicles to uh, the calcium source. And we see that it's absolutely not the same distance that there is a broad distribution. And then we fitted that to a Rayleigh distribution, which is the green one with this mean. Uh, and, and, we, and we really, uh, I, I think this was a nice fit. We also had one other uh, data set that has uh, more or less the same fit. 
So, of course, uh, this is uh, uh, a cross-section, and what we are actually have is uh, a two-dimensional space, so around the calcium source. So what we had to do here, we, we only see the cross-section, so what we had to do is integrate it around, and here we then finally get the final uh, distribution of uh, the distances. Because, of course, there are less area close and much more area around. So this actually becomes more a uh, more symmetric distribution, you could say. And actually, the integrated Rayleigh distribution is a generalized gamma distribution, just for those that want to know that. And actually, also the mean changes. So the mean was a little below 100, now it becomes 122. These are actually the two means that we saw uh, before in the calculations of the calcium uh, transients. And what was very, very nice, so this, okay, so this, uh, was determined by, by, by these images, and we find this distribution. But after all, we didn't have that many observations, so we somehow also wanted some kind of independent uh, assurance that this was the right distribution. And for me, this is very few times that this happens in statistics. Uh, that is that you take completely independent data. This is from some super-resolution microscopy with pictures that uh, uh, illuminates where vesicles are, and then they are centered around all these pictures, were then centered around the calcium source, which is here, and then average, and we see this distribution. And then if you look at that distribution, which is the purple over here, we actually get, uh, th this is the, the, the distribution from the data set, and then we plot it on top the distribution of the integrated Raleigh, that we fit it to the other completely independent data set and we got this. So this, this one is not fitted to this data set. It's completely independent. And of course, we could maybe get a little better. This, after all, it's, it's just statistics. But it, it, it really made us trust in that this is the distribution. So actually, the, 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 the project here started as a small project saying, OK, so we know we don't have the same distance. We want to see this. Uh, uh, broad distribution of distances, and then let's just find the facilitation, the model for the facilitation. And then it turned out to be a much larger problem, and it took us a lot of work just to understand something that now seems very trivial. And and <laughs> and you might, when I give the explanation why this happens, it might also seem trivial to you, but it was not to us before we understood it. So just, uh, just to put everything in place, uh, uh, we... Uh, well, Janos did a lot of simulation work. So just to explain what the simulation was like. So here we have another picture giving us these active zones. If you remember the active zones, so one active zone has one calcium channel and then vesicles around it uh, docked in order to ready to, uh, uh, to release when action potential arises, calcium flows into the cell and then it releases neurotransmitter. So here they are stained so that we can see the active zones. So these are active zones. So these are completely different uh, uh, spatial scale than the other pictures. Then we zoom in on this, and this is what we look at. And then we look at this active zone, and then we find the four nearest neighbors. And this is all in order to figure out how 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 is the distance from active zones to one another. Then we did some uh, 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 average over the four nearest neighbors that gave us how big should the simulation volume be, and we ended up with uh, cylinders like this. So the blue down here, this is the bottom, that is the membrane, and then we uh, uh, simulate in cylinders like this. And then we make reflecting boundaries, and why do we do reflecting boundaries? Because we assume that if it if if a calcium comes here and hit this boundary, it will have other calcium floating in from the other side of more or less the same size from some other active zone. And now, if you see these four, these are four different time steps simulating the calcium influx. No calcium influx at 1.6 milliseconds, practically none. Uh, 1.8 milliseconds, we see this. Then at two milliseconds, it is the highest, and then it goes down again and disappears. So it's this very, very short profile. We also see that the simulation volume is much bigger than where we can even notice any calcium. And then we start placing our 
uh, docked vesicles according to this distribution we found before, and then we see what happens. Okay, let's get to some models. So the basic model was uh, that we used was a single sensor model, and that was a model that had worked before. It had been uh, constructed uh, uh, actually for only single pulses, so not for the paired pulse, but for the single pulse. And this model is very capable of reproducing nicely uh, the first uh, uh, response. So we, we thought that maybe um, trying out a little bit on the parameters, we would be able to optimize it and get uh, a good fit for this uh, uh, distributed uh, distances. Oh, what happened? Sorry. Um, well, many problems we discovered. And I must say, I am impressed with the patience that Janos had to really, really try to figure out because we worked on this model really a lot and it turned out that it just didn't work and it took us so long to understand this and now i'll just present it in one hour and everything seems trivial but it was really not trivial so let's understand this model this is simply a continuous time finite state marco uh, uh chain okay so it has uh seven states uh, zero to five and then a fused state so fused means that is when the so, so the vesicle each vesicle lives somewhere in these six states okay if it's in f it means it has fused and has released its uh, neurotransmitter then we know that uh, uh, th there are some complex uh, uh, um, workings here where uh, calcium is increasing its uh, probability of releasing so it's the calcium that makes it it uh, want to release. So it ha can have zero calcium uh, 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 attached or one or two and up to five. So here we have an, um, with, with this model uh, with five. Then the rates going from one state to the other, the on rate, that means the on rate of, of attaching a, a calcium is calcium dependent. So this is where the calcium transient comes in. So in the moment that the calcium flows in, then these rates of moving up in this uh, uh, Marco chain increases. And then it has an unbinding rate, which is just constant. Okay. From each of the state, there is a probability of fusing given by these colors. You can see that. So uh, the probability of fusing, if you're in state five, is really high. And down here, it's really low. Then we have a vesicle pool, which are all the vesicles that were not docked. And in the moment that uh, a vesicle fuses out, there is replenishment. So this is the replenishment. I'm not going to talk about this today. But let's just say there's a vesicle pool and it could get, get, get uh, uh, replenished in the moment that it has uh, released. So very simple model. Uh, Janus actually fitted it. And what were the results? Let's look at the results and the problems. So this is a complicated slide, but I will uh, uh, go through it. I have no idea how I, I'm going with time. Uh, let me just see. Okay, it's fine. So let's concentrate first on, on this B. So we have the black ones are, again, we already saw that. This is just the, the average pair pulse response from the experiments and for the five different calcium concentrations. Then we have the simulations which are, of course, there are many simulations. So the red one is the average over all simulations. So what we see is actually the first one is more, maybe not here, but, but the first uh, 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 pulse or the first response, current response, is actually captured quite well, which is what we see over here. So this one means the amplitude of the first response, OK? for the extra cellular calciums. And here we have the five uh, uh, experiments and then the simulations together with their, uh, uh, with the standard deviations around, okay? So we see we can actually get that quite well. Now we normalize it just so we can really see facilitation and uh, depression. And we see there's no way to make the facilitation. There is no facilitation in the, in the simulations. We, we actually don't even get a depression here. So forget about the green one. Uh, so these ones 
are the pair pulse ratios that we have also seen before for the different extracellular uh, uh, concentrations, but we're just not able to push it up and get any, we don't get any facilitation at all. We don't even get the pair pulse ratio past one. But that is not the only problem. We also see here, now we see the red one is the average. So here there's only simulations, there's no data. So just the simulations and then uh, single traces where we can see the variance. And here we see the black one is the experiment and the red one is the best fit. We have a two huge variants. So this model simply cannot reproduce what we want. And the only real difference was the fact that we, instead of having the same distance to the calcium source, we had a broad distribution to the calcium source. Why can that be? So what is going on? So here is the first explanation. Well, here's an explanation. So why does the single sensor model fail? So this row is one simulation. This is another simulation. So it's just to have two examples of simulations. Now, look at this one. This is immediately before the first action potential. And we see that we have a lot of docked vesicles. And the color in here, the dark color, means they are primed and ready to be released. This is before the action potential. And actually, in this model, they are all docked. Okay, they're all they're all primed. Sorry, they're all primed. So they're all ready to release. That will be important later. Okay, it will be very important later. But for now, just notice that we have uh, 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 all of them ready to release. And these are just two realizations drawn from the distribution of the distances. So let's look over here. This is the distance. So here we are just on top of the calcium source. And here we go out in the distance away from it. And then this black one is the distribution of the synaptic vesicles before the action potential. What will the release probability be? That's in blue. Well, the release probability is, of course, a function of the distance. So if you're very close to the, to the source, the probability of release is practically 1. Oh, you see 1. Uh, these small numbers actually are the probability of release. So we see 1 at 0 0.97, 0 0.99. They're really high. That means that all of this distribution of the vesicles, all those that are placed, let's say, in this distance, so this part of the distribution will all release. Now, the, the probability of release here is practically zero. So everything that's in this part will not release. And then we have a very short little area here because this is steep. So it comes from the fact that this is steep where there is some probability that is not either zero or one, let's say. Now comes the action potential. So now we see that in this simulation, three of them actually released in this simulation and here five of them. It's stochastic, so it, it changes from time to time, okay? We do that a lot of times and then we get the distribution. So here is the blue, in this blue is the distribution of the released vesicles. And of course, they are the close ones. All that are very close are released and then some of them that are a little further away, all that are very far away, none of them uh, is being released. So the blue plus the gray gives the black. Now passes a little time. There's a small uh, delay, this 10 milliseconds before the second action potential. What happens? Well, they're replenishment. So they're all being, uh, uh, they're being uh, uh, primed again. There are new vesicles. So they're all again ready. They're placed the same places because that's where uh, the, the right uh, uh, proteins are to have them. But they are uh, once again primed, all of them. Uh, so we are actually back. Now comes, this is immediately before the second action potential. We again have the probability that looks uh, very much like the one before. There might be a slight uh, residual uh, uh, calcium uh, from the first release, but it's very little. So it's practically the same. The gray one was the vesicles that we had left 
from the first one, but then we had replenishment and we come up and get the same distribution again. Then they release and well, we get, these are uh, the second release and the first release. So we see that uh, sometimes you see there's a single one here that was not uh, replenished, it's still stochastic. So just the fact that they might have nearly the same amount of uh, uh, available vesicles, but a little fewer. They can never, ever make facilitation because it only has available what was there already or a little less. So how come that this happens just because we made a broad distribution? Well, because if we don't make a broad distribution, but make them at the same distance, they would all be placed here. So instead of having this uh, broad distribution, we will have one peak distribution here, and maybe half would be taken to the first one, then they're replenished, and then maybe just the residual uh, calcium, whatever, could make it out again. But in the moment that we stretch out, we will have one side of the distribution where all of them always get released, another where they never get, and just a little bit to just a very, very few ones to play with. And if we put it the same distance, they're all there to play with. But it's just not follows the biology. So, so uh, I, I hope I could communicate why this single sensor model fails. Then we used lots of time to think about what could we do? How should we solve this? And then the first uh, thought was um, to make a dual sensor model where there is a second sensor of calcium. So the center is, is for the calcium that has the same type of kinetics, but are slower. So one that can have kind of residual calcium attached to it from the first action potential that the first, that the vesicles in the first action potential don't get a chance to use yet because it's slower. And then uh, when the second action potential comes, the, there is this residual calcium that it could use. So going in this direction there, so this is kind of the model that was there before, uh, is the first center and then we have a second center. And again, we have the probability of release. So here there's really huge probability of releasing. It's a little smaller, uh, etc. So this was our, uh, our first goal to find a model that might keep enough residual calcium in order to get facilitation. However, life is not that easy. And we had big problems with the dual sensor model too. So what happened? Well, again, we could reproduce the first one here. First amplitude, fine. What happened with the second? Well, we did have some facilitation. Yes, we did, but it was not enough. So if we look over here, we could just get it over one, but there was no way to get it up to where the exper experiments. Then a new problem arised, and that was in order to get that facilitation, we had to put up uh, uh, the, the calcium so much in the second sensor that actually there was this, what we call asynchronous, uh, asynchronous release, which means that they're released after that uh, the signal is actually stopped simply because we had to squeeze so much calcium in, in order to get the second release that there was too much for it to actually uh, stop again. And then we even have a third problem, namely we still had a huge overshooting of the variance. So that one didn't work either. And at this point, I think Yenus was, uh, pulling out his few hairs from his head in order to figure out what to do. Uh, but actually, uh, there was a third model that could actually help us. We actually tried four models, I only, I only talk about three of them. Namely, an unpriming model. And here comes in the importance of what I said, that in the other models, all vesicles that were docked were also primed. So, if you look at this, ignoring this blue thing, we have the first model, okay? We have the single, single uh, uh, sensor model. So the only thing we, we, we did was introducing this rate also, which is calcium dependent. So what is that doing? It is saying that vesicles 
might get unprimed. If they are unprimed, they cannot release. They have to be primed in order to release a neurotransmitter. And that this is calcium dependent, such that the higher the calcium concentration, the less probability of being unprimed. But if it's very low, a calcium concentration, there is a higher probability, it's actually given up here at the rate, there's a higher probability of being unprimed. Okay? And I'll get back to the biological discussion of what that means later on. So just this single little adding actually solved all of our problems. So let's look at it. Amplitude, still fine. Now, now we have, a, 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 again, normalized to the first one. We get facilitation and depression as it should be. We are right on top of the experiment. So uh, this is really, really a uh, very, very uh, happy situation. And if we look at this, okay, you could say we still have an overshoot of variance, but it's very little. And in fact, um, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure my, my, my good co-authors agree with me, but here I am uh, entitled to say something. I, I'm not sure that their experiments are quite... Uh, 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 necessarily down there uh, because it's made of very few uh, it, it's made of, of six different cells or, that doesn't matter so we actually also get the variance correctly so so what so 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 just such a small thing what what did happen so so we want to understand the mathematics behind it we want to understand what is the mechanism that does that this little thing can actually do what we want it so why does it work? So we already got used to look at these figures. So let's look uh, at what happens in the unpriming model. One example, another example. So here we have all the placements of dark ve uh, ve vesicles, but only some of them are primed. So here we have a low calcium concentration because from high uh, extracellular ca calcium concentration, they will all be, be primed, okay? So we have part of them are not primed. Here is even a larger part of them that are not primed. But those that are primed, th this, this circle, I sorry, I forgot that to say that before, uh, I think gives the, the, the probability of, of 0 0.25, so one fourth, okay? So uh, those that are primed inside the circle have a high probability of releasing, uh, but there are some inside that cannot release. So let's look at it. Here we have the synaptic vesicles that are available, so these, these. This is the distribution before the first action potential. We still have this release probability. Now we see, okay, here, the, both of these re uh, uh, released. Here, uh, these two released. Uh, these three did not. It's just a si simulation. And we see here, over many simulations, these are the ones remaining. These were the one released after the first uh, action potential. So what happens in the small time before. So now we look at immediately before the second action potential. Well, it turns out that, well, in, in, in this case, it didn't have to be like that. But in this case, all of them got primed. And why is that? So I go back one. Here we had a lot that were not primed. I go back one just so we can see the model. We have this rate. This rate is calcium dependent. So before the first action potential, the calcium concentration is very low, which means that this ride is high, the rate is high, and we have a lot of unprimed vesicles here. Then comes the first action potential, and the residual uh, calcium increases and makes this rate much lower. Here we still have a constant rate that spills over here, but now we have no spilling back here. So it's like you could say this, it, it has a spill here, but in the moment that the first action potential arrives, it stops this one. So it activates the system. So we have the first release, the second release. We got all of them primed again. So here we got from whatever was left, refilling, and we get back to actually a much higher uh, uh, amount uh, 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 of uh, primed vesicles that can actually release. And then we have the second potential, and they actually release more than they did in the first one. So here we have the distribution of the second 
compared to the first release. So I think uh, this is a, a very nice explanation of what is going on. Um, I can see I am very uh, close in time and I want to discuss a little bit. Okay, I'll, I'll do, I, I think I only have a few uh, um, slides left on, on, on these explanations and figures and then come some discussion. So let's look at the on-priming model, what's going on. So here we have extracellular uh, uh, calcium and then we see what is, so, so look at the red one first before we understand the blue one. The red one tells us what is the basal calcium concentration inside the cell for a given extracellular. So the higher the extracellular, the higher it will also be inside. So we have the, the inside of the cell has a certain uh, 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 concentration. Then we have the proportion of the, 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 the primed vesicles will depend on how much calcium there is exactly because the unpriming rate depends on the calcium. So if the calcium is high, they are all primed. But if the calcium is low, there are a big proportion that is not primed. So let's look at two situations for two different calcium concentrations. So here we have high calcium concentration. All of them are primed. Then comes the first action potential. Since all of them are primed, a lot of them are being released and disappears. And then it has to build up priming again before the second one comes. Whereas the low calcium concentration, there are only some of them primed, so they cannot release a lot. But then the increased calcium makes the priming uh, uh, go up, and then it has a, a larger one. And how does that look for the dual sensor model? Well, we can actually see it can do something of the same kind. But the problem is that when we turn on uh, more calcium in the dual center, we necessarily also turn up for the first center. So it, it for the first so 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 wh what it what it uh, changes is the release probability. Okay, we have the second center, so we have uh, 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 um, increase of uh, probability of the release, but when we increase the release probability for the second action potential, we also increase it for the first. And this is what we see here. Uh, so this was the best fit we could find. And we actually did see an increase in the second compared to the first. We could get, we could get even more, but then we would get even more in the first and nothing would fit. So the best fit is not for the largest one because we need also not to have too much for the first in order to get facilitation. And it just didn't work. We could even explore parameter space in the unpriming model, uh, um, I don't want to use too much time to explain this, but uh, here we see the pair pulse ratios, and here we see the number of states. So here in three-dimensional space of parameters, uh, if you want, you can ask about it, but for now, let's just see. The pair pulse ratio in this experiment was here, 1.8. And then the best fit in our unpriming model was very close to it, okay? So I, I, the best fit is here, given here. But we can see that the model is actually able to, um, it is a, sorry, so, uh, sorry. Uh, so the, the, the unpriming model is able to reproduce pair pulse ratios that is very big. That was not for our experiment. It was only 1.8, but it can actually reproduce up to four or five even. And that is seen in other synapses. So that is a good thing. We can also see that the number of, of sites that it estimates, the best fit is here and the experiment is here. How did it look for the dual uh, uh, model? Pff, much worse. The best fit is here. The experiment is up here. Uh, notice that there's not the same scaling in these two. So the experiment is up here and number of sites more or less, but not quite as well. So even if you explore the whole parameter space, you cannot find it. Okay, so these were the main results, and then I, I'd like to discuss a little bit what all this means. We don't care about that. This is a repetition. So, so for the first, we saw that having a realistic vesicle distribution actually enhances the depletion of vesicles in the basic model, and that gives us problems because the depletion weakens the second response, and that gives us depression and not facilitation. Whereas if we made a calcium inhibited unpriming reaction, so it is the unpriming that is uh, calcium dependent, 
not the priming, the unpriming. Uh, and we just do that to the basic model. That is actually sufficient to reproduce these uh, pair positive values that we uh, that we see as mean as the as well as the correct mean and, and variance relationship. So uh, our our main conclusion is that this uh, calcium dependent accumulation of 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 the releasable uh, uh, synaptic vesicles it is a plausible mechanism for these pair part facilitation at the synapse that we looked at, but it's possibly also a, a, a good explanation for central synapses. So the insights that we have gotten is that the synaptic uh, uh, vesicle distance distribution, well, it's a generalized gamma distribution. I think it is quite uh, uh, nicely described by that. And it is a consistent with what has been found that there's an exclusion zone of around uh, uh, 30 nanometers around uh, calcium channels. And this distribution actually gives that the probability will be less than one and a half percent. We also understood that this broad distribution actually impedes. So this is probability of release. Okay. So this is the probability of vesicle release. And the first two models were probability based facilitation mechanisms. I mean, they, they, they change uh, uh, the probability of release. But this broad distribution actually impedes that the mechanisms are there. So the problems with the, the dual uh, fusion sensor model was exactly the second sensor increases release probability for both action potentials, not only for the first, uh, for the second, sorry. Too much and uh, synchronous release, unrealistic variance mean behavior. And moreover, if you look at it as uh, from a biological point of view, it has an ineffective use of the broad vesicle distribution. Why would why would the system biological system give us this vesicle distribution if we don't use it? So so we believe that a secondary calcium center acting on the energy barrier is not the one that will give us facilitation when we have broad distribution of these uh, distances. Okay, so we had two types of stochasticity in this model. Well, we had it uh, uh, both in the distribution of, uh, uh, so, so you could call it the, the starting conditions of where we place the vesicles, but also in the Marco process of, of uh, um, just because it's a stochastic model. And this was important because we have deterministic and stochastic simulations do not agree on these paired pulse ratios values. And this is especially important with this facilitation because it has a larger effect uh, uh, um, uh, for, for, for where uh, there is low calcium, so it is exactly where there is facilitation. And it's Jensen's inequality, or it's just, just the fact that uh, um, that uh, mean of nonlinear functions are not the same as the nonlinear functions of the means. And we need to quantify variances cannot be done without a stochastic model. What we did not do was do stochastic calcium channel. Gating. So we, th that would be another stochastic part that we could include. And that might be important if the synapses and the stochastic vesicles are, are located together in pairs or something like that, then this might be important. But what we saw was with the distance to the calcium channel uh, uh, location, the single, um, let's say, channels inside this center was not so important. So we don't think it really matters for, for this work, for this uh, uh, synapse that we looked at. So the on-priming model, it actually includes this calcium dependent uh, uh, increase in what you can, what are available of, uh, of uh, vesicles. And it's actually important, this thing that the, that, that the calcium dependence is, is on the on-priming and not on the priming, because there's been other models where it's on the priming, but, but that didn't, it did not work. It would not create this a uh, uh, special um, uh, uh, effect that we had for, for this. And, and moreover, this fact uh, that for, 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 for when we have this broad distribution, we actually need a higher calcium influx. So we estimate a higher calcium influx. It makes a more effective use of the entire uh, synaptic vesicle distribution, which from a biological evol evolutionary um, aspect would be more natural. So, okay, so just to, 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 to wrap up some biological explanation. So uh, there is some uh, um, um, protein uh, suit seven, 
uh, which has been shown in, in other studies that it's linked to this short-term facilitation behavior. So our, our question is, is that maybe also for our uh, synapse that we were looking at? Uh, what is also interesting that the literature has also reported that it is actually, uh, uh, so, so it's not quite clear how it works, but it has been reported to actually function in the vesicle priming and the replenishment, which is exactly what we did in the model that worked. So our question is, does the function of this protein in this short-term facilitation take place by this calcium-dependent inhibition, inhibition of vesicle on priming, what was the model I presented, or maybe something, now I just say it, release side activation. That was the second model, we, or a fourth model we also tried uh, that gave the same fit. We cannot see that from our data, but this uh, it, it, it is a natural question to ask that might be asked, uh, looked upon in, in future work. Um, so, last discussion is, um, so, so, so we need these increases in the stochastic vesicles to get this pair path facilitation. Uh, so, so, the question is, is this relevant for tonic synapses? that built up during this uh, longer stimulus trains, which we have not seen here in, in this work, that's called frequency facilitation, or is the pair pulse facilitation, which is actually a more widespread phenomenon. So, uh, uh, so maybe uh, it is more natural to use it for, for, for this type of problems more than the frequency facilitation. So uh, it might actually be, this is one of the main, uh, uh, messages, it might be a general fe feature of these chemical uh, synapses. So um, here I'm just repeating what was already there. And here is the reference. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. It was beautiful, a nice uh, relation between biology, mathematics. Uh, so it's beautiful. Uh, I have a question. I think it's uh, in slide 21, where you introduce this uh, right function. Uh, uh, or maybe uh, when you when you introduce this R function, you remember uh, in the model. Uh, so maybe it's after before. Uh, you yes here? Uh, here here it is exactly. Well, you didn't comment so much on the form of this uh, function, but it's very important because it is a hill function, uh, somewhat which is related certainly to some kinetic reaction. Uh, so uh, there are two questions. First, if this is a pure uh, mathematical guess, uh, then I think you did fit, or I don't know how much does do the result you obtain depend on the half activation constant, which is called Km, and how much this, does it depend on the exponent n? Uh, this is the first question. And the second question is, there is certainly a link with the chemical re uh, reaction, because this is a typical form you, you, you have in this case. Do you know any connection with, for example, this uh, C7, or any co connection with the chemical reaction, even, even uh, kinetic reaction, even with uh, calcium? I mean, this is a, a, a Michaelis Menten uh, yes. equation, yes. and the Km was uh, uh, fitted. The N, I, I don't know, maybe Janos can say, but but uh, uh, so 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 it's a Michaelis Menten, uh, yes. uh, uh, um, and, and we can actually see down here. Uh, uh, K-min is here and here. So we actually okay. see it, Sorry, it does, I, I it does matter. It does matter and it is fitted. And uh, what about N? If you N, change I, it? Uh, I, I, I need Janos to answer that. So, uh, Janos, okay. Can, can you answer that? Or I don't know. Yeah, sure. I can uh, elaborate. So we tried out different Ns. Of course, N is always an integer. So oh, uh, of course. we didn't uh, fit it. We just tried because it corresponds to some cooperativity uh, yes. of this, uh, of this uh, mechanism. And we could also uh, fit the model very well with an n equal to two. Um, the fit was better than equal to five and also was supported by some uh, findings the biologists already had on uh, mm -hmm. how this, because if you suspect, for example, that the synaptotagmin seven is involved in this, then there's something about the cooperativity of that protein that they want to incorporate, yeah. But it turned out to work on with different ends, so yeah. 
Yes, because it's very important because this mechanism basically, as you say, the push the, the, the histogram in the middle of, of you, you are going in the middle of the of the sigmoid where in the place where the slope is uh, is higher. And I think it's uh, typically the type of mechanisms you have also in homeostasis in, in in many examples of biology. So I think here you have something which is more than math. There is, uh, in my opinion, there is something biological. Uh, below that. Maybe uh, Christophe could comment on that. But I think it's really a beautiful result. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions. First, you didn't say much about the way you model calcium dynamics. Uh, model what? Sorry, I couldn't hear. The calcium dynamics. The calcium dynamics. No. And you, you want uh, a little more? So, yeah, because, uh, I mean, you, are you modeling concentration or ions? Uh, concentration so, uh, and Janus can correct me. So we use this uh, software by uh, Matweb. Uh, so here, here we can see it's, it's not very uh, easy to see here. So it is simply like a Gaussian uh, as a uh, into. So so we have kind of a so Gaussian to the diffusion. Yes, uh, with some okay. So, so it's just a concentration. Yeah. Then, so you have a concentration profile at yeah. any. Uh, in time and space. So when when I, I, I discuss briefly these kind of problems with my students, I always ask them to compute how many ions they get in a small box as what the one you drew for the concentrations you, you, you got. I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Do you, Janus? <laughs> it's less than one. No, I, no. we did the calculation at some point, but I, I, uh, I don't remember. So it's it's less than one. Less than okay. one ions. If you if you take a, a box one by one by one micrometer, and you have fifty nanomolar uh, concentration, you will get less than one. So that means you have very few calcium ions. Oh, it's micromolar, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, second, you you said that you used um, boundary conditions that are, are reflexive. And that was not a problem because you have uh, other channels uh, opened nearby. But as soon as you model the calcium open, I mean, the channel opening as stochastic, you can't assume that the nearby calcium channel is also opened and therefore that your reflecting boundary conditions are valid. Yeah, but uh, first of all, we don't have stochastic uh, uh, calcium channels here. Yes, they but, are deterministic. But yes. I, I don't. I, I really don't think that it matters because if you look at it, all the action is going on here, practically. There's nothing going on here, and and the concentration is so low, the probabilities are so low. So whether you have reflective or not, there's nothing going on out there. So it is just a question of what's going on here. It might be that it should be stochastic. That's another thing. But now, now we, we we take it as deterministic in okay. this in this case. Uh, so uh, last question: How many parameters do you adjust in total? Four, four or five, I think. It's not so many. Am, am I right, uh, uh, Janus? We only have four or five. Yeah, that's correct. Um, could I just add a comment on the reflective boundaries? Yeah. So um, I think so. The, the reflective boundaries. Uh, was assumed because people assume these active zones to work uh, in parallel independently and i agree if they were stochastic we we could not be sure that the neighboring uh, calcium channel was open however in these simulations that uh, during the time course that we were analyzing it wouldn't matter at all but it would of course matter if we simulated for a longer time then there would be some kind of uh, distributing uh, calcium um in the in the volume so in that case it would matter yeah okay and so um in your basic setting uh when you use a, a 10 millisecond interpulse interval the interstimulation interval uh, does the uh, calcium concentration come back to zero and to rest level uh between no there's a residual calcium okay. Okay. And that, that is one of the points of, of, of trying to use that. There is a small... Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. The, just the basic mechanism, though, the unpriming that you have in the step from one to zero, uh, yeah. you introduced to make the model work. You made it calcium dependent. But yeah. how does that um, influence your assumptions about the other 
So this is the single sensor model, right? So when you added the RU between, sorry, between zero and vesicle pool, yep. uh, this is an unpriming, but unpriming is happening a bit everywhere, right? Like from five to four and four to three. I don't think so. No, I think it has to be from zero. I think, uh, am I right, uh, uh, Janus? It has to be from zero. Uh, we did both, and it didn't uh, matter. And then the biologist uh, preferred the one where it only took place from zero. So, so the unpriming is a phenomenon, really, that operates between vesicle pool and zero. So, so I think. So what we did was both implementing unpriming to take place from zero and also to be able to uh, unprime from all the, the six states from zero to five. And it didn't make um, a substantial difference in the results that we got. But I think the biologist's argument was that since the synaptotagmin is the one centering the calcium and it cross-links with the plasma membrane of the cell, they would assume that if a lot of calcium was bound to synaptotagmin 1, it would be un, uh, uh, very unlikely that it would unprime again. Okay, so that's a good justification. I mean, you tried it along the rest yeah, yeah. of the chain, yeah, yeah. But, it but it doesn't matter. It's the main, the main key is to have it at the first stage here. Yeah, it might yeah. be that the probability right. is so yeah. small that uh, and, the other uh, states, yeah. And just uh, two two general questions. Like a, a lot of the literature on these vesicles, you know, they, they it's it's lovely to include the distance distribution, but they, there's also an inclusion of uh, distribution of vesicle sizes. That does not come in the picture at all here. Uh, can no. you comment on that? That's another important stochastic aspect generally, but I don't see. You know, is it relevant? It could be, but we, we, we didn't do it. I mean, it's mentioned in the discussion that we didn't do it and that might influence, but uh, we, we also, assume them all the same. Okay. And then, and this is uh, uh, really the local environment of one channel, right? And this, so I'm wondering if you can, uh, if you generalize this to other systems that aren't neuromuscular junctions, you know, some more central synapses, um, is it is it a often the case where you can analyze paired pulse ratio or assuming there's only one local micro environment like this or do you have to bring in many other calcium channels and and effects bleeding over from other channels like uh, Yannis was just saying a few minutes ago i have no idea i don't know yeah so in this case i think uh well it is similar to having identical uh, active zones, uh, identical small areas contributing uh, in the same way, right? So it's just a matter of placing 100 vesicles around the same calcium channel or placing two vesicles around 50 channels or whatever. Um, I see. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. You can... And that's why we just tried to to, uh, to estimate when we did the estimations of the, the simulation volume and the calcium influx, it's somehow an average uh, active zone. Okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Nice seeing you again.